I want to start by uh, making a statement that, that I think we need to, to really take to heart. It's often said uh, cheaply that times are unprecedented. Uh, the rhetoric of living in strange, unusual, unprecedented times is very common, I think, throughout history. And most of the time, it, it is an exaggeration. It's, it's simply not the case. Typically, most of the things that we've experienced in our lives, you can find precedents for. But I think there are two things that make the particular times in which we live at the moment uh, unique and, on that level, uniquely disturbing. And I think it's these two things. I think, one, we've seen emerge over the last 15 or 20 years a radically new way of understanding ourselves that has become the dominant way of thinking about what it means to be an individual. At the very same time, we've also seen the collapse of traditional institutions. And I want to talk about those two things tonight. And I think the confluence of this transformation of how we think about ourselves uh, with the collapse of traditional institutions places us at a peculiar crossroads. I spent the, uh, the flight uh, uh, this afternoon. I'm uh, working on an article with uh, a, a young uh, writer at National Review, Alexandra de Sanctis. We're working on an article on, on transgender issues. And I finally plucked up the courage to read Abigail Schreier's book, Irreparable Damage, which is a study of how the transgender issue has really taken off among young women. And I was struck in reading that, at how she was, Abigail Schreier is, is describing anecdotally precisely this confluence of a sort of crisis in understanding what it means to be a human self and the collapse or the liquefaction of the institutions by which we typically identify ourselves. And it's that really that I want to talk about this evening. First of all, though, I want to define three terms that I think are important. The first is I've already used this term, the self. Uh, what do I mean by the self? When I use the self in this lecture, I'm not talking about that common sense element of self-consciousness that we have, that I'm aware I'm not Ian. I won the lottery of life. I was born an Englishman. <laughs> By the way, Ian, you should always remember that... <laughs> he who speaks last laughs longest. Is, uh... I'm not talking about that common sense, sense of self, where I'm aware that I'm me and not you. We all have that sort of sense of, of personal identity. What I mean by self is this. What makes us tick? How is it that we understand ourselves in the relationship to the world around us? How do we think about what constitutes us as real and authentic people? In the book, I use uh, the example of my grandfather, and I compare him to myself in order to, to bring this out more clearly. You might be saying, well, what's he, what's he going on about? If my grandfather, grand, granddad's been dead nearly 30 years now, but if he was here tonight and I was to say to him, Granddad, uh, did you get job satisfaction? And my granddad was a sheet metal worker. He worked in a factory in Birmingham all his life. He left school at 14. He worked till he was 65, banging sheets of metal. He did a job that I would regard as, as a drudge. But I think if I said to my granddad, did you get job satisfaction? Uh, first of all, he may not understand the question. I suspect that issue never crossed his horizon. But if I was able to explain it to him and say, well, did you find your job worthwhile and fulfilling? I think he'd say, yeah, I did. Because most of the time, I got paid a fair day's wage for an honest day's work. And I was able to put shoes on my children's feet and bread on the table. And my granddad telling me he'd never been in debt a day in his life. And he was a poor man. It's hard to imagine that now. You know, we all live on the assumption that we're at some level of debt all the time. And my granddad would say, no, my, my job gave me satisfaction because it allowed me 
to fulfill my obligations to my family. If you said to me, Truman, do you get satisfaction from your job? I'd say, yeah, I, I love teaching. I love standing in front of a crowd of young people, explaining a difficult idea, and seeing the light bulbs going on in eyes. As suddenly, that which they did not understand, they finally grasp. And I would say, I get a real buzz out of that. Notice the difference between the two answers. For my grandfather, his satisfaction came from him fulfilling obligations to others. It's an outwardly directed notion of the self. For me, it's inwardly directed. For me, it's all about my immediate feelings. And the difference between my grandfather and myself is the watershed difference in the understanding of the self that has become dominant in our modern world that lies at the heart of so many changes that many of us now find very disturbing. So that's the first term, the self. The second term which will come up uh, at points in my lecture, sexual revolution. I think if I were to ask most people here, you know, what are the most dramatic or disturbing developments taking place within society the last 5, 10, 15 years, probably you'd, you'd come up with things that we might bracket under the umbrella term, the sexual revolution, the dramatic acceptance of homosexuality. Uh, 2015, Ober Obergefell v. Hodges the discovery of gay marriage as being protected by the Constitution. Caitlyn Jenner, the mainstreaming of transgenderism. Pride Month. These things, I think, for those of us, you know, traditional Christians brought up in a certain generation, these are perhaps the most startling developments. Uh, Katrina and I were in Georgetown in June during uh, Pride Month, and uh, uh, there was one shop in Georgetown that I was glad to say didn't have the pride flag. Georgetown Tobacco. I've always regarded it as the last bastion of freedom in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> you're able to go in there and buy this stuff that you're not supposed to buy. And, uh, but everywhere else, everywhere else, were pride flags, homoerotic posters, etc., etc. And I commented to Katrina as we walked back to the car, I, I made some comment to the effect of, we didn't just lose the cultural war. We've been wiped off the face of the map. Very, very dramatic. The sexual revolution. But I think many of us think of the sexual revolution in these terms. We think of the sexual revolution as an expansion of what might call the canon of acceptable sexual practices. So once upon a time, adultery was socially unacceptable. If you committed adultery, you would be shunned. Then it came to the point where adultery was, was seen to be less heinous. You were no longer shunned for sexual adultery. Once upon a time, uh, sex outside of marriage has gone on throughout human history, but it was, it was disapproved of. I remember staying at a hotel as a, as a young kid, and my mother discovered that one of the young couples there were not married. And she kept talking, oh, they're allowing people to come here and live in sin in the hotel. You know, it was a shock. It went on, but it was considered to be something that one didn't want to boast about. Well, now, it's acceptable. Homosexuality has become acceptable. And I think most of us think about the sexual revolution intuitively in those terms. The sexual revolution is about the expansion of things that are now considered acceptable. I don't think that is a correct understanding of the sexual revolution. I think what the sexual revolution does is this. It's not an expansion of what we might call sexual morality. It's the abolition of sexual morality in its entirety. And I would offer two pieces of evidence for that. First of all, what is it now that makes a, a sexual act wrong? It's whether consent was involved or not. As long as all the parties involved are consenting... It's okay. Well, think about what that tells you about sexual activity. It means that sexual activity in itself has no intrinsic moral value. The moral value comes from the context. And that's a dramatic change. 50, 60 years ago, sexual acts were seen as intrinsically wrong. Now they're only wrong if there is a lack of consent involved. 
Consent, of course, is extremely difficult to establish. Consent is a very complex thing, but setting that aside for the moment, most people think as long as there's consent, it's okay. The second thing I would throw up is this. Uh, think about modesty. I first became a Christian, uh, I think, in the early 80s, early to mid 80s. And the churches I belonged to, occasionally there'd be debates about modesty that would, would bubble up to the surface. And, you know, it, it, I suppose it sounds sexist, and to an extent, I guess it is sexist, but the dates. The debates were typically about women's clothing. That was generally where modesty sort of found its, its uh, controversies. Uh, length of skirts, one-piece or two-piece bathing suits. These were the kind of debates that went on. We don't have debates about modesty anymore in society, when you think about it. When uh, one of my boys graduated from high school, uh, my wife and I were pretty shocked at the way some of the young girls were dressing for uh, the graduation. One of our friends, who's actually an atheist and a fairly militant atheist, complained to the school and got nowhere. Got nowhere. Uh, I was uh, speaking at a Christian school uh, within the last uh, few months, and I had spent some time with the faculty afterwards, and, and this was at a Christian school. And one of the teachers says, what would you advise me to say to a young girl who tells me that her parents are, uh, are allowing her to have breast enhancements for her 18th birthday present? For a Christian school. Modesty. We don't debate modesty anymore. Modesty is an inherently ridiculous concept. That's what the sexual revolution has done. The sexual revolution has not expanded the meaning of modesty or modified the meaning of modesty. The sexual revolution has rendered modesty as an inherently ridiculous concept. I haven't seen the movie The 40-Year-Old Virgin, but I know it's a comedy. How do I know it's a comedy? We live in a world where if you reach the age of 40 without having had a sexual experience, you are by definition unfulfilled and ridiculous. So the sexual revolution I refer to on occasion, sexual revolution is, is not about expanding the bounds of what is acceptable. The sexual revolution is a completely different view of sexual behavior. I think based on a completely different view of what it means to be a human person. And that leads me to my third definition. Underlying this notion of the self, underlying the sexual revolution is this. It's the phenomena that Robert Bella identified in the 1990s as emerging as the normative American and I would say Western notion of the self, expressive individualism. And this is how he defines it. Expressive individualism holds that each person has a unique core of feeling and intuition that should unfold or be expressed if individuality is to be realized. What Bella's saying there is this. The emerging notion of what it means to be a self is intimately connected to inner feelings and one's ability to express those inner feelings outwardly. Symptoms of that in a culture will be a preoccupation with individual authenticity and self-expression. Go to the interview with uh, Bruce, now Caitlin Jenner. You can find it online with Diane Sawyer, 2015, I think for 60 Minutes. And look at the language that Jenna uses there. It's fascinating. Jenna says, now I'm able finally to be myself. No longer am I having to live a lie. No longer am I having to conform to the expectations of society. I'm free to be myself. That's expressive individualism. Jenna has had this core of feeling that it's finally legitimate to express outwardly. Think about how in the newspapers often when a, a sports star or a movie star comes out and abandons their wife and children and runs off with some guy. Think about how the newspapers present that. They very rarely these days focus on the broken family left behind. They valorize the person doing it because guess what? They're authentic. That language of authenticity emerges from this notion of the self. Take it back to when I used myself as an example earlier. What did I say? How I feel. It's how teaching makes me feel that's so important to me. 
I'm an expressive individualist. So how do we get here? How do we get to the point where this notion of what it means to be a human being, this expressive individualism, specifically this expressive individualism that expresses itself through a sexual idiom, how did this arrive? Well, the first thing we need to know, realize is we didn't get here because people read books on this stuff and were convinced by the arguments. That's not how we think. Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor has this rather, it's rather awkward sounding term because he uses an adjective as a noun, uh, the social imaginary. I'm going to read what Taylor says about the social imaginary and then so, so offer a sort of gloss as to why it's a useful way to think about our current situation. Taylor says this, I want to speak of social imaginary rather than social theory because there are important differences between the two. I speak of imaginary because I'm talking about the way ordinary people imagine their social surroundings. And this is often not expressed in theoretical terms, but is carried in images, stories, legends, etc. But it's also the case that theory is often the possession of a small minority. Whereas what is interesting in the social imaginary is that it is shared by large groups of people, if not the whole society. Which leads to a third difference. The social imaginary is that common understanding which makes possible common practices and a widely shared sense of legitimacy. Okay, that's the kind of academic ease. What is Taylor saying here? What he's saying is that the way we all relate to the world most of the time is via our imaginations. We imagine the world to be a certain way. I have absolutely no idea about how atoms, molecules, and physics operate. But at the end of this talk, I'm going to leave through the hole in the wall called the door over there. Because I imagine the world to be such that when I walk through holes, I can get through to the other side, rather than banging myself up against something solid and doing myself damage. That's a trivial and perhaps ridiculous example. But then think about how we think about other things. Think about how we think of morality. Very few of us have read great textbooks in ethics. But our parents taught us to think of the world in a certain way that has a certain moral structure. Think, to take uh, perhaps a more controversial example, think of the gay marriage debate in the United States. Uh, In the run-up to 2015, I had numerous people say to me, you know, can you give me good arguments against gay marriage? And my answer was always, I'll give you several good arguments against gay marriage. But none of them will work. Because very few people have come to believe in gay marriage as a result of arguments. Their imaginations have been gripped by thinking of the world as being a particular kind of world. Watching Will and Grace. Watching The Ellen Show. Having gay neighbours who are really nice and decent people. These things shape our intuitions. They shape the way we imagine the world to be. So what I want to do in this, uh, in this lecture is, so how is it that our imaginations about what the world is have been shaped in the way they have been, that have led to these dramatic changes we now see around us? Think of that statement, which we've heard perhaps many, many times, maybe from a member of a family, maybe from a friend, certainly on the television. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. 20 years ago, that would have been an inherently ridiculous statement. I don't think my grandfather, if he was alive today, would have the categories to do anything other than burst out laughing if somebody had said that to him. And yet now, it's common currency. It's common currency. And it's not just common currency among those who happen to have sat in Judith Butler's seminars on queer theory, gender theory, it's the intuition of larger and increasingly large number of members of society. They've come to imagine that the world is such a place that that statement now has not just an inherent plausibility to it, but a compelling truth to it that means that those who won't acknowledge that statement might find themselves in serious hot water. 
Think about uh, when somebody says, I'm gay, or I'm lesbian, or I'm queer, or I'm straight. Think about those statements. That's very interesting. It's very interesting that those statements root identity, that sense of self, in an inward feeling or desire, particularly a sexual desire. I actually think transgenderism is a little different. Ask me about that if you like afterwards. I'm not sure that transgenderism is, is quite as sexual as the L, the G, the B and the Q tend to be in that uh, alphabet soup. Uh, think about it though. Even if you identify as straight, that's odd, historically speaking. If you're chatting to somebody from the Middle Ages and said, who are you? They'd have said, well, I live in this place. I'm the son or daughter of this person. I pursue this as my earthly calling. The idea of identifying relative to an inner desire would have been bizarre, quite bizarre. I did classics as an undergrad, and we had to, of course, you, as a, you do classics at least before it was redefined by Princeton University, so then you do classics without actually having to do any classics. In the old days, when you had to actually study the original text, etc., etc., you very soon come across, and particularly in Greece, there was a lot of homosexual activity going on. What's interesting is that no ancient Greek person identified as gay. Now, a child can go to their parents and say, Dad, I, I think I'm gay. And they may not actually be saying anything about any activity they've ever engaged in. They may just be talking about the inner direction of their sexual desires. Same with being straight. We live in a world now where we identify in terms of our sexual desires. How did that come about? Well, one simple way of sort of bringing out what must have happened is to, to think of a sort of two parallel scenarios. Think of going to a doctor a hundred years ago and saying to the doctor, I think I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. The doctor a hundred years ago would have said, that's a problem. It's a problem with your mind. And we need to work on your mind in order to bring those inner feelings into line with your body. If you went to the doctor today and said, I think I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, the doctor would again say, that's a problem. But may even be compelled by law now to say, that's a problem of your body, not of your mind. Compare those two scenarios. What must have happened in the interim of those two scenarios for that flip-flop, that reversal to have taken place? Well, I would suggest it's this. Inner feelings have become more authoritative than bodily reality. We might say inner, let's be less contentious. Inner reality has become more authoritative than outward reality. Who you feel you are has become more important than who your body says you are. So we could cast this story really as one where slowly but surely that inward space, that inner space, have been given more authority. Well, that tracks with expressive individualism, doesn't it? One of the things I want to say, really, in this is the sexual revolution is just a particular manifestation of a broader phenomenon, this increased emphasis on inward feelings. Well, how does it start? Well, there's an intellectual genealogy we can trace here. By the way, tonight's all bad news, by and large. Uh, tomorrow is more bad news, but with a little bit of good news thrown in there. Good news is God is still sovereign. Everything else is a disaster, I'm afraid. But that's, that's good news. Uh, I just, that's to encourage you to come back tomorrow night. I just can't sit through another night of bad news. There will be good news at some point tomorrow night. Uh, I'm a pessimist, but I'm kind of a cheerful pessimist, if I could put it that way. Uh, I, I take great pleasure in, in, in you know, everything's, everything's bad but it's going to get even worse. That's the kind of take I have in life. Uh, and it's going to get even worse before it gets even worse than that. The inward turn. We could trace the intellectual genealogy of the inward turn. I mean, 
I've had various people email me about my book. Yeah, one of the problems when you write a history book is wherever you start, there's always some smart aleck who says, why didn't you start the day before? Because something happened the day before that's kind of important. So I've had people email me and say, you started with Rousseau, why didn't you start with the Reformation? Why don't you start with the late medieval era? One person wrote to me seriously and said, I don't understand why you didn't begin with Eve in the garden. It's kind of, well, I didn't want to write a book that was 100,000 pages long. You know, it was a sort of, think of the trees. You know, all I can say at that point. This move inward, this authorizing of inward feelings is galvanized really, I think, in the Reformation and the post-Reformation era. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the other great Geneva, after John Calvin, uh, is the man who in the 18th century wrestles with, he's really wrestling with a a, a number of of issues. One of them is, in what does morality consist? How does society affect us? And Rousseau's basic uh, notion is, he's a kind of anti-Augustine in many ways, is human beings are born basically good, but society messes us up. Like all great errors, it sort of contains a a grain of of truth. Uh, Rousseau's famous maxim, of course, is man is born free and everywhere is in chains. A couple of comments on that. One, say to the students, just because something is self-evidently wrong doesn't mean that it can't be believed by an awful lot of people and come to be a guiding force in society and culture. That maxim is very influential. Uh, And yet it's self-evidently wrong. Uh, As Carter Sneed from Notre Dame in his book, What It Means to Be Human, has pointed out, human beings are born remarkably dependent upon other human beings. Uh, When my boys were born, if they'd been born and we simply dumped them in a field somewhere and wandered off, they'd be dead. Human beings of all creatures on the face of the earth are born remarkably dependent upon others which I would have thought would have raised the question, even for secular people, maybe our definition of what it means to be human should take dependency rather than autonomy as its starting point. But for Rousseau, it's society that messes you up. And if we could just get back to that inner voice of nature, everything would be okay. Rousseau goes so far as to argue that once laws exist, that's a sign something's gone seriously wrong. Because actually... Instinct should lead us to be empathetic. And it's only because we're not acting on instinct and empathy that we actually need these laws imposed upon us. What Rousseau is really saying there is feelings. Feelings are what constitute genuine humanity. And this is picked up and developed in a wonderful artistic way by the Romantics. I feel sort of bad in seeing the Romantics somewhat as villains of the piece in the story I tell, because I love Romantic poetry, and I love Romantic music, and I love Romantic painting. Uh, Percy B. Shelley, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, What do these men do? They produced artwork that pulled on the emotions. You can get a bit in Beethoven's late string quartets. If you listen to Beethoven's late string quartets, you know something interesting is going on there. I don't know anything about musical theory. But when I listen to the late string quartets, you can tell that the classical structures are starting to break down. That Beethoven is trying to say something that the old forms won't allow him to say in quite the way he wants to say them. If you compare Bach to Liszt, for example, you'll get the picture Liszt's music is stormy. It's appealing to the emotions. The romantics are really pointing us to that inner space. To be a real human being is to get in touch with that inner space, not to conform to outward standards. Louise will know exactly what I'm talking about here, but when we graduated, if you remember, the guys all had to line up against the wall and we had to raise our pants or trousers as we called them in those days so that Mr. Monument, the head porter, if you remember him, walked along and would inspect all of our socks to make sure that they were the requisite colour black. Because if you weren't wearing black socks, you'd be sent back to your room to change into a pair or you wouldn't graduate. The point was, of course... Education in those days was not about expressing your individuality. 
It was about being tamed and made part of the team. I'm struck at American graduations how all the kids do their own thing. They decorate the hats. They don't wear ties. They, they look dreadful, you know. But they're all expressing themselves. As recently, I saw a, a news story about a school that was trying to reintroduce school uniforms. And the parents are objecting because they're saying, why can't we let the kids express themselves? That's the romantic sensibility. A joke, I went to a traditional, it was a state school, but it was a traditional boys' school, a grammar school. The purpose of my boys' school education was to have my individuality crushed. That was why team sports were so important, to be crushed and made part of something bigger than myself. Now our kids are taught there is nothing bigger than themselves. It's that romantic sensibility. Feelings are constitutive of authenticity. And that means that external structures become problematic. External structures become those things that make you inauthentic, that prevent you from being yourself. So that's the first stage in the intellectual story. The second stage is what I call the sexual turn. You could trace this out through the 19th century, but it culminates in the key figure of Sigmund Freud. Freud is interesting in that he agrees with the romantics. Yeah, the real you is that inner space. But that inner space is not the idyllic region that Rousseau and Wordsworth thought it was. That inner space is dark, destructive, and above all, sexual. And Freud, in his three essays on sexuality, has this fascinating taxonomy where he traces the growth of human beings from infancy to adulthood entirely in sexual terms in terms of the nature and the direction of sexual desire. What Freud does there is dramatic and brilliant. He changes sex from an activity into an identity. He makes you fundamentally a sexual being. And while many of uh, Freud's psychoanalytic theories are now regarded as complete bunk, that one continues to grip the imagination. That's the message that's preached from every movie you watch, every sitcom, every soap opera you watch. Ian and I were talking on the way uh, from the airport this afternoon, and he mentioned, he said, do you ever see I, Claudius? Glad to say, I'm too young to have seen I, Claudius. I do remember my parents talking about it. I said, oh yeah, wasn't that kind of pretty dodgy and controversial at the time, the BBC dramatization of that? And, and Ian laughed and made the comment and said, you know, today it would be a PG. Every movie we see now preachers that sexual desires and the fulfillment thereof are what fundamentally constitute you as an individual and a fulfilled life. And that's followed by the political turn. Think about it. The, the, the changing of sex into politics was inevitable. Once sex becomes identity, it has to become political because at the heart of all civilized society lies a sexual code. And Freud was spot on on this. And Freud actually thought sexual codes were pretty good because they preserved civilization. But at the heart of all civilizations, there have to be definitions of what are and are not legitimate sexual relationships. But once sex becomes identity, those laws become laws about who is a legitimate person and who is not. Who gets to be recognized and who gets to be shunted to the margins or even sent to prison. Once expressive individualism then meets with Freud and sex becomes its primary idiom, we have a need for a sexual revolution. To return to a comment I made earlier, that's why modesty is now ridiculous. Modesty is an inherently oppressive concept because when you have criteria of modesty in place, you are telling people how far and in what form they can express themselves. And so you are forcing them into inauthenticity. Well, that's the intellectual story. How does this become plausible in the wider culture? Technology. Can't deal with all of the reasons why this becomes plausible. One of them would be this. Technology. 
Again, let's go back to that, that authorization of inner feelings over outward reality. That's implausible in a non-technological world. One of the mistakes we often make when we think about technology is we think technology allows us to do the same stuff, only better and faster. Technology fundamentally changes the way you imagine the world to be. Imagine if you're born in the Middle Ages. Almost certainly. Well, I would probably have been a knight in shining armor. My friend Ian here would have been a peasant. <laughs> an agrarian peasant. He'd have been a, Scots, you know, a Scottish peasant. Poor old Ian. His life is entirely subject to the rhythm of the seasons. He has to sow his seed in the spring and harvest it in the fall. And he has to hope that the weather behaves and allows him to bring in a good crop. The world is very fixed for him. But Ian's descendants, hundreds of years later, well, they got access to fertilizers. So soil and location isn't quite as commanding as it once was. They have irrigation now. Anybody here lived in Phoenix? No human being should live in Phoenix, strictly speaking. You can only live in Phoenix once you have certain technologies in place. Irrigation, air conditioning, etc., etc. Think about how that changes how you imagine the world. Ian, the medieval peasant, sees the world as very fixed and authoritative. Ian, the 21st century farmer, Well, to an extent, farming is still somewhat dependent upon the seasons and upon geography, but far less than it once was. Ian's imagination is being tilted towards thinking that the world doesn't have a structure, the world is just stuff. And if we can develop the technology that allows us to manipulate that stuff, then we can impose our will upon it. Technology brings with it this imagining of the world as something we can control and we can shape. That's why something like COVID is so hard for us to cope with because suddenly nature bites back. Suddenly we're faced with something we can't control and we have no way of handling that other than a massive Herculean effort to reassert control. Time, space, control, everything has changed. Bodies. Bodies. You can only have a trans moment in a world where surgery and hormone treatment can make the idea of changing gender plausible. That's why a hundred years ago the doc would have said, this is a problem. We need to deal with your mind. Because the doc would not have been able to imagine dealing with the body as the problem. Wouldn't have crossed his purview. The world, the technological world, as we imagine it, increasingly moves from having a meaning and an authority and a structure to being just stuff that we can shape in accordance with our wills. That's why, uh, you know, if you think trans is odd, there are people who don't think they have any gender at all. I was reading recently a heartbreaking letter from a mother to a, a newspaper that her child uh, decided each day what gender they were and was very offended if the parent used the wrong pronouns. And how is she to handle this? Everything has become fluid. That brings me then to another strand of the story. Hold that in mind. I used the term recognize earlier on, and again, I want to use the term recognize here in a slightly technical way. There's the basic recognition. I see Louise. I've known her for nearly 40 years. I recognize her, and I say, hi, Louise. There's that sort of common sense recognition. But there's also recognition that connects to, what I would say, status within society. One of the things... One of the things that all human beings want to do, well, there are two things, I think. We all want to be free. We intuitively experience the world as free agents. We get up in the morning, we choose what we have for breakfast, we choose what jobs we have, we choose whom we marry, we choose what time we go to bed. We don't experience the world as if we're automata. We don't experience the world as if we're marionettes. 
We don't experience the world like Wallace does in the wrong trousers, you know, when he's trapped in those robotic trousers that take him off to commit armed robberies and things. So that's not how we experience the world. We feel we're free. We may not be as free as we think we are, but we experience, we feel the world is free. We want to be free, but that's not enough. We also want to belong. We also want to belong. When I teach this stuff at college, I, uh, the, the title of the, this lecture is, Why Do All Teenagers Look the Same? It's interesting. There's nobody who wants to be free and assert their own individuality more than a teenager. And they all end up looking, dressing, talking exactly the same as every other teenager. Why? Because they also want to belong. Almost every human being, with the exception of sociopaths, wants to belong. And belonging depends upon recognition. We want other people to see us as having value. And that depends upon structures in society. To be recognized, to belong, depends upon there being structures that recognize us, to which we can belong. And typically those structures are defined by things like morals, patterns of behavior, etc., etc., the rules of the game. Now, think about that. Think about that in terms of expressive individualism. Yeah, you want to express yourself, but you also want to belong. How do we tie these two things together? Well, this is where it gets very problematic for the present age. Very problematic indeed. When I was growing up, my mum and dad weren't Christians, but dad and mum, they were the great love of each other's lives. And I was never in doubt about who I was. That was my family. I could point to my family. Later when I became a Christian, I could point to my church. I'm English, as you've been reminded this evening. I'm proud to be so, I have to say. I belong to a nation. Think about it. The nation, the family, and religious institutions are all in flux today. The nation... To be in a nation involves an act of imagination. Why is it? It's not, nations are not strictly geographical. The person in Houston lives closer to the person in Guadalajara, but would traditionally have considered themselves to be an American, not a Mexican, and therefore to have more in common with somebody from Maine or Washington State. There's a story that grips the imagination, that binds people together. Those stories are now in crisis. 1619 Project. I don't want to make any comments on the, the virtues or whatever the 1619 Project. What interests me is that it exists. That the national narrative that when I emigrated 20 years ago, three weeks before 9-11 as it happens, when everything started to get interesting, the national narrative would have been unchallenged. I remember in 1996, when I was a visiting fellow at Calvin College in Michigan, Katrina and I went uh, one afternoon to, we were in the park, and there was the homecoming, I think, of of the nine tribes. Nine Native American tribes were gathering together in the park for a celebration. We stood and watched. And at some point, all the Vietnam veterans, the Native American Vietnam veterans, stood up, saluted the flag, and sang the national anthem. And that was striking to me because coming from outside America, I thought, surely the Native Americans will resent America because of the history. But no, the national narrative bound them together. I'm not sure that would happen today because the national narrative is in crisis. Why is it in crisis? number of reasons. One of them, though, I think is technology. Technology allows events across the other side of the world to be more real than events next door. I wrote my book around that sentence, uh, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. A close contender at the time for me was he pledged allegiance to ISIS online because I think you can get at precisely the same issues. What does it mean when a kid from a good home in London finds this mythical thing in the Near East more real than his neighbours and his parents? What's going on there? Identity is being transformed. The nation is being transformed. Think of the family. 
Think of the relentless assault on the family from the early or late 18th, early 19th century onwards. How often is the family portrayed in sitcoms and movies as ridiculous or oppressive, as crushing the individuality of the individual, as preventing that young, expressive individual from expressing who they are. Fascinating that the trans moment has been fueled online by videos. And one of the main targets of those videos is your parents are screwing you up. And if your parents don't buy in to the trans narrative you want to tell them, then you need to get rid of your parents. I, I shouldn't do this, but I almost smile now when I chat to Christian parents who think that because they homeschool or because they send their kids to Christian school, they're somehow keeping them safe. I would say to you, schools are almost irrelevant now in the way young people think about themselves. Almost irrelevant. It's cell phones, it's smartphones far more influential than any physical presence. Technology has done that and has fueled, further accelerated this collapse of the family. Think of the church. The church, uh, rife with inward corruption and slammed by the culture outwardly. The church has no credibility. Now think about what that does to identity. The three primary ways people would typically have identified themselves in the past, which we might add a fourth, geography, which again has been undone by technology. We can now drive and fly, move. I live three and a half thousand miles from where I was born and grew up. It would have been very hard to do that a hundred years ago. Not impossible, but hard. Think about how the collapse of all these things means that we have this confluence. We have the expressive individual where the idea is the real you lurks within and all of the traditional ways of finding stability and identity have disappeared. Think about what that does. Well, one of the things I think that does, the evidence is emerging, is it makes young girls tilt towards transgenderism. One of the things that Abigail Schreier does so well in her book is says, you know, uh, growing up as a girl is tough. And by and large, it's all about body image. It's all about body image. And now girls are being hammered continually from all sides online about body image. Well, what do they do? They seek for somewhere to belong. The transgender community turns a geek into a cool person overnight. That's one of the terms of recognition in our society now. Trans is cool. That's why I made the comment earlier, I don't think that trans is quite the same as the L, the G, and the B. I think if you're looking for an analogy with trans, anorexia, bulimia. It's essentially a form of body dysmorphia. I had a young man contact me recently and... uh, said he wanted to talk to me about some struggles he was having, and we, uh, we met online, of course. It was during COVID, and I knew this young man. I said, okay, just tell me what's going on. What do you want to talk about? And he said, my problem is I think I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. And I said, well, that's interesting. Uh, tell me about it. Where, well, when did you start feeling this way? Why do you start feeling this way? And he said, well, it goes back to school. He says, at, at school... I was bullied by the boys. He said, I was a geek. I was in some video game. I can't remember what it was. And I was bullied by the boys. He said, and the girls were kind to me. He said, and I, and he, this was his words, not mine. He said, I just wanted to belong. I just wanted to belong to people who would make me feel welcome. Expressive individualism places a huge burden on the individual to invent themselves. At a very point in history where the standard ways of belonging are vanishing. And new ways of belonging are emerging to fill the space. Shaped by the Freudian sexual revolution. Shaped by technology. Shaped by a way of imagining the world where everything is fluid. We have a world, if you like, where a plastic notion of what it means to be a human being is emerging at the very point in time 
where all of those things upon which we would typically rely have gone liquid. That's the bad news. I'm trying to give you the good news tomorrow night. But to summarize this, what does this mean for us? Well, it means various things. I think, first of all, it means that we are living at a point in time which is unprecedented. I think the challenges we face today are remarkable. I would also add, when I think of technology, the speed of technology makes today remarkable as well. Think of the Reformation. I used to teach the Reformation uh, every year. Reformation, one way of looking at the Reformation is it's 150 years of bloody warfare and conflict as Europe stabilizes in the light of a technological revolution. The printing press changes everything. Politics and religion are transformed by the printing press. And Europe goes through 150 years of bloody struggle in order to find a new stability relative to what the printing press has done. Think about the technological revolution we're living through. I think it's what sociologists now call social acceleration. What do you mean by that? Technological innovations are happening so fast that society does not have a time to assimilate them before the next technological innovation comes along. And that means we have this constant feeling that everything's rushing away from us. Everything is becoming vertiginous. Everything is becoming unstable. So the first thing I want to say is we live at a uniquely unstable time. Secondly, we live at a time where we need to realize as Christians that the old arguments aren't necessarily as pungent and powerful as they used to be. Uh, when I was university, uh, the argument could be used when you were chatting to a gay person. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I hate the sin, but I love the sinner. That only works in a world where the sin is separable from the identity of the sinner. Now, of course, if you hate the sin, you hate the sinner. I'm not saying that's right, by the way, but I'm saying that's how it's heard. It's why, for example, cake bakers get into trouble when they won't bake cakes for gay weddings because the cake baker thinks he's uh, exercising his religious freedom. The gay couple think he's refusing to recognize them as legitimate members of society. We need to be aware of that because that, I think, is a reminder to us that the times are going to get much harder at this point. It's going to be very, very difficult to, to dodge what's coming and still be faithful. And thirdly, I think, and I want to talk about this more tomorrow night, thirdly, I think that places on the church a burden of thinking very self-consciously about how it teaches, particularly how it teaches its young people. Uh, the church has got lazy for many generations now. Uh, we might say the basic ethical structure of the world and the ethical structure of the church kind of overlapped significantly. Now we're at a point where they're emerging in an antithetical, adversarial relationship. And that means we can no longer rely on the current, the moral current of the world to carry most of the weight for us on these issues. And that's what I want to talk about tomorrow night. Throw it open for some questions, if there are any. Right. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, the question, I think, is... Uh, I, I said that arguments against gay marriage don't work, so what can we use? I think I'd want to sort of qualify my rhetoric a little bit. I would say it would depend on the context. I certainly think there is a case to be made for the usefulness of arguments, particularly within the church. We'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow night, but I think with, say, young people today... I, yeah, I teach at a Christian liberal arts college... I can have kids come into my office and say, you know, why is homosexuality wrong? And I can point them to biblical verses. And you know, for most of them, that will sort of be sufficient. And what I mean by that is this. If, if, if the word says it, then the word says it. But I suspect that many of them will have at the back of their mind a further question. Well, does the word say it because God's just mean and doesn't want my gay friends to be happy? And I would think in that kind of context, arguments from you know, what might be called natural law can serve a subsidiary helpful function. 
Well, God's word says it and that's authoritative. Oh, and by the way, God's word says it because it makes perfect sense. Let's go to the government websites and look, for example, at the illnesses slash life expectancy of men engaged in an active gay lifestyle. And, and let's see what that tells us about this lifestyle. And you can begin to see then that God's law says this, and that actually connects to the structure of the way the world is. So I think arguments function well on that front. Secondly, just because an argument isn't going to work doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't make it. And I think even, even in the secular setting, let's force our opponents to look ridiculous, even by their own standards at points. And I think that that can serve a, a, a function as well. But I do think that it also points us to the fact that we need other things to convince people that we have a better way. And I would say one of the most obvious ones is strong and robust marriages. I would say the church taking marriage seriously. Uh, one of the lectures I give at Grove on the redefinition of marriage, I say, who, refi- who redefined marriage in America? It wasn't Anthony Kennedy in 2015. It was the patron saint of the conservatives, Ronald Reagan, in 1970. Ronald Reagan signs into law in California in 1970, no-fault divorce. And at the stroke of a pen, he turns marriage into a sentimental bond that can be dissolved as soon as one or both parties decide that the marriage is no longer doing it for them, regardless of the impact on the children, etc., etc. That was Percy Bysshe Shelley's view of marriage in the early 19th century. So... I think one of the things the church needs to do is start taking marriage seriously itself. Husbands need to start loving their wives. Wives need to love their husbands. We need to show to young people what marriage can look like. That's why I think that uh, uh, they're not so trendy now, but these sort of generation-exclusive churches are bad. I think it's great for young people to see a couple that have been married for 50, 60 years. I think it's great for young people to see a couple have been married for a long time and maybe one of the partners is now tragically ill or has Alzheimer's and see the other partner lovingly care for them. So I I think there's... Yes, we need to address the marriage issue. Bible, arguments, but also practice and culture. We need to show the world that we take the marriage seriously. I have every sympathy in the world with a gay couple who say, how dare you object to my marriage when you people don't take marriage seriously yourselves. I, I'd have to say, well, I don't agree with your situation, but you landed a good punch. Uh, that's a long question to repeat, but I, essentially you're asking, what is the role of a Christian teacher, given the way that this stuff is permeating even, even Christian schools? I think that your role is very limited. I think it's, if you don't have parental support, it's, point, it's almost pointless. That's a very depressing answer. But I think a lot of this comes down to parents. I think parents need to stop their kids having smartphones. No kid needs a smartphone. Kid may need a phone to contact the parents to get a ride home from school or something. But no no kid needs to have a smartphone. No kid needs to have unsupervised access to the internet. That's not a right. That's something parents have granted to children now. Cards on the table, I'm very glad that my boys grew up before all this became an issue. Because, to be honest, would I have been strong enough to stand up to my own kids on this? I hope I would have been, but I I don't know for sure. But I think parents have got to stand up to their kids on this. Sadly, legislation is already being mooted that will increasingly limit parental power on this front. But at the moment, you know... The issues are things like if your kid comes out as trans. Well, I would suggest if your kid's not on social media, the chances of your kid coming out as trans are very, very small. The actual occurrences of what might call medically diagnosable gender dysphoria are very small. I don't want to trivialize the agony of people who struggle with those things at all, but their number is very, very small compared to the large number of those who claim to be trans. Most of those claiming to be trans have been inspired by online videos, TikTok, etc., etc. Well, if they don't have access to that, then they won't think in those terms. So my answer is, you need to talk to the parents. Sadly, I don't have a lot of confidence in a lot of Christian parents. 
When I go to a Christian school and I, and I hear from one of the teachers, what do I do when the parents have suggested to this girl that they'll get her a, a breast enhancement for her 18th birthday? I, I don't know what to say to that. I really don't. So keep on doing what you're doing. Be, do your vocation faithfully into the glory of God. Trust the Lord for the increase. But I think your responsibility is pretty limited. You want to be able to go to bed at night and think, nothing I did screwed these kids up. That may be a small ambition, but it's a worthwhile ambition, and it may be the only one you can have. Last question. Yes. There was a time, maybe I'm betraying my own generation, when as a new Christian, the challenge was how to stand against modernity and secular rationalism. So I early on learned the apologetics in that form, and that was helpful. Help me navigate college and other things. Um, and one of the antidotes to that was to recognize that we were not merely our reason. We, to use say a bit before, we had a heart, mm. a spirit, whatever seems to be the most efficacious term to use there. And yet, and I'm speaking as a, as a former college teacher, I recognize at a certain point, maybe 15, 20 years ago, that the battle had shifted to another location. And yet I couldn't quite shake the idea that it was good to emphasize that I and all people are more than merely thinking machines, a la Descartes or some such modern, somewhat secular rationalist. And I wondered if in doing that, I and maybe others like mine could unwittingly or maybe even wittingly participate in moving or sort of this almost anti-rational, well, I mean, there's a whole other issue with some of the other philosophical backgrounds of what you're saying, but um, the emphasis is on feeling. Mm. Uh, that's a huge question. I apologize for making it so broad, but I'm wondering, especially in light of quoting someone like Reagan, who in many yeah. ways want to stand for something um, more natural law uh, what your thoughts might be about how to stand against modernity without yeah. postmodern kind. So it's a good question. The question is about the, the role of feelings. Is there a danger that Christians have overemphasized feelings and therefore played into this? Um, absolutely. But I would say that you know, feelings are important. It's, it's interesting, at the same time as Rousseau is exploring the inner space, Jonathan Edwards is writing the religious affections. This, this, th- there is a place for introspection. One of the things the students always point to me in class, what about the Psalms? The Psalms are full of feelings. So I say, absolutely, it's why I love the Romantics, because it isn't all reason. There's a strong feeling component to this. I think the way, the, the part of the story that I sort of omitted that makes the current situation possible, of course, is the abolition of the notion of human nature as having a moral structure that regulates this stuff. Nietzsche, Marx, Darwin. Nietzsche abolishes human nature. Marx pushes it to the future. Darwin relativizes it completely. Uh, I think that what the... I, I think you're right in terms of there could be a danger that we overemphasize feelings. So I say that, that hymn. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. I had a fundamentalist secretary at, at Westminster. That was her favorite hymn, and I love to tell her, that's German liberalism. That's German <laughs> liberalism. Uh, I think the, where the church, you know, there, there are periods in, church, in the church's history where different doctrines become important. Reformation, it's justification and sacraments, I think. Today, anthropology. I think the church needs to, needs to realize that not everybody assumes there is such a thing as human nature. I think the whole blossoming of identity politics we're seeing now is connected to a lack of belief that there is, that that which binds us together is greater than the particularities that divide us. So I think in the next 12, 10 to 12 years, the church needs to preach the whole counsel of God, but needs to realize the particular pressure point is anthropology. And oddly enough, it's, you know, the Roman Catholics are, are kind of ahead of us on this, because they have a theology of the body, they have a tradition of moral, strong moral and ethical reflection that we don't have. The great thing is we can plunder their stuff because a lot of it's really good. But I think when, I, when now I'm asked by students, you know, what do you think would be a good PhD topic? 
20 years ago, I might have said New Testament or Old Testament. Now, I always say ethics. We need some good ethicists. Because it's not just the sexual revolution and the people out to undermine us. It's, it's the, the, the good Christian couple who can't conceive a child. I want to know, is IVF acceptable? What can I do if, 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 if I'm saying I desire a good thing? I want to have a child. How can we go about that that's ethical? And it's hard to point people to good stuff, Protestant stuff, that will help them in those situations. So I think anthropology is going to be the key. Yes, maybe there was a period where it was too rational and we needed to re-emphasize the importance of feelings. Now we need to focus on anthropology in order to anchor those feelings in something real.